afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you've heard, my name is Ferhan Khan, and I'm responsible for corporate development at Vern Global, an innovative data center owner and operator. After hearing some of the fascinating talks today, it's a pleasure to be standing in front of you to be able to share some of my thoughts on the Internet of Things. What I would like to do is approach the Internet of Things from a slightly different perspective, one that I hope will allow us to understand some of the fundamental challenges posed by the huge growth of connected devices. So to begin with, here's a picture. What do most people see when they see a picture? Well, clearly, that's a very open question. But I imagine, as a doctor, I see the human body as a machine that I can fix, much as a mechanic views a car, a machine that I can fix and repair as and when the need arises. If, on the other hand, I'm a designer of wearables, as many of you in this room are, I see it as a as around which I design my objects, just as an engineer or an architect designs buildings around a landscape. A friend of mine actually designs wearables that are powered by the human body, and he views the human body as an engine from which he can harvest power. But I'm a geek, and given the audience here, I suspect I'm in fairly good company. And the way I view the human body is as a large network. I see the brain as a CPU or a central processing unit to which are attached a huge number of nodes that provide it with sensory input. <coughs> this isn't an, a new idea at all. Um, certainly it was introduced to me in the mid-90s um, in a book entitled The March of the Machines where he thinks about, um, by Kevin Warwick, sorry, where he thinks about um, living organisms as networks and networks as living organisms, and specifically the telecom networks. And what he does is he assigns the se seven characteristics of life to the telecom network. So in viewing the human body as a network, I started to think, if we had the opportunity to redesign this network in the body, what would we change? Take, for example, the sensory inputs that come from my hands and my feet. All of that data ultimately is fed to my brain. In order to make that more efficient, therefore, does it make sense to have a number of smaller brains at various points, perhaps in each, uh, in, in each wrist and in each ankle? Well, <clears throat> that makes some sense, but let's look at the practicalities. In order for these brains to function, they need ample blood supply as well as physical security, which isn't the easiest of engineering feats. And if, for whatever reason, I were to lose a hand, I would be losing vital processing power as well as a lot of blood. Ouch. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. Perhaps, then, the thing to do is to scatter some brains along the central axis of the body. This makes eminently more sense than having brains at the edge of the network where um, they can fall off. Um, but again, if we think about the, the blood supply situation, we need to supply these incredibly oxygen-intensive brains. As bef that, and that's before I even think about the physical um, vulnerability of the areas of placing them. So it just starts to get inefficient. So as I played around with these ideas, it occurred to me that I should probably stop trying to be too clever. I should probably just accept that billions of years of natural selection had placed the brain in the most logical and efficient place, right here. The fact that I'm able to stand here and speak to you, and you're able to sit and listen to and absorb, at least I hope absorb, a lot of what I'm saying uh, whilst our bodies continue to function, is a testament to that fact. Turns out that our friend Charles Darwin just might have been onto something. <clears throat> so let's consider what makes this positioning so optimal. Well, there's good physical security in the form of this thick skull. Owing to the large blood vessels of my, in my neck, there is good in, uninterrupted and ample blood supply. And thanks to the high density fiber running down my spine, there's good connectivity to the rest of the network. Now, <clears throat> as, we think about the hum, uh, as, we, as we think about the brain, it turns out that this thing is incredibly energy intensive. Despite only being 2% of a typical person's body mass, it takes up 15% of the body's cardiac output, 20% of the body's oxygen, and 25% of the body's glucose. And that's 
a product of the evolutionary process. As our brains have got larger, they're able to process a lot more data. And as, they, as they're able to process more data, they need a lot more energy to do so. So <clears throat> what does the brain do with all of this energy? Well, what it does is it takes all of this data coming from my hands, my feet, my vital organs, and all of my senses, and processes it all to make it useful for me. That's remarkable when you think about it, because not only does it make, not only does it take data that's useful, it filters out all of the data that isn't so useful. This room's particularly quiet, but in most scenarios, there's a whole lot of background noise that people are subjected to, and your brain's incredibly good at filtering it out. People are using keyboards and, 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 and phones, etc., and yet you're, you're simply not aware of it. If, however, I were to let up a firework here, or someone at the back of the room was to start screaming for some reason, you'd certainly wake up and pay attention. And that's thanks to the remarkable processing power of the thing between your ears. Now, <clears throat> there are some things that your brain delegates to other parts of the network. Reflex actions and other such actions are delegated. If you step on a sharp piece of glass or touch something hot, your body is able to act very quickly without your brain being aware. Your brain only becomes aware of it a split second later. And, and so in network terms, the way we think about that is there's some local processing going on in parts of the body. So that's interesting, I hope. And uh, I guess you're all sitting there saying, what's my point? Well, my, my point here is that I think that the Internet of Things is creating a network that mirrors more or less everything I've just described. You have all of these sensory devices that are providing the network with huge amounts of sensory data. Be that from smart watches, smart buildings, smart cities and fridges and all of the amazing things that all of you in this room are working on. Much like the sensory nerves in your eyes, you have eyes that act as eyes of the network. Uh, you have devices that act as eyes of the network. Much like thermoreceptors in, in your skin that sense, te sense changes in temperature. You have devices that connect to the internet, which um, are able to sense changes in temperature in your homes. And all of these devices are, are generating huge amounts of data every second of every day. And that's where I see the real challenge as the internet of things develops. Just as our brain is incredibly good at dealing with this bombardment of data, in order for the Internet of Things to be successful, our network needs to be able to deal with the huge amounts of data that it's going to be bombarded with. Cisco estimates that there will be 50 billion devices connected to the Internet by 2020. That's half of the total number of neurons in the human brain. And that's the human brain, which is widely accepted as the most complex object in the known universe. To deal with all of these devices, thanks to the IPv6 protocol, we have enough internet addresses to be able to assign 100 internet addresses to every atom on the face of the Earth. So returning to the brain, let's look at the hardware that the brain has to deal with all of this data. It's thought that the brain can perform 38 quadr quadrillion calculations per second. That's 38,000 trillion calculations per second. That's amazing. In computer speak, that's 38 petaflops, a petaflop being 1,000 trillion calculations per second. To, to help us frame that, let's look at the history of supercomputers. In 1997, we had the first supercomputer capable of a teraflop, in other words, a trillion calculations per second. It then took 11 years for IBM's Roadrunner to come along in 2008, and that was capable of a petaflop, in other words, a thousand trillion calculations per second. And as you can see, Tianhe 2 is today's um, fastest supercomputer, capable of 34 petaflops. So that's 34,000 trillion calculations each second. So we're not too far from overtaking the human brain, which is capable of 38,000 trillion calculations per second. And if this exponential growth continues, and some estimates um, predict it certainly will, we'll have the first computer capable of 150 petaflops by 2018, and perhaps even an exaflop scale computer by 2024. 
So my point is that we're about to overtake the human brain in terms of processing power in a huge way. But the brain still manages to hold the trump card, and that's in terms of power efficiency. Your brain manages to perform all of these calculations on a mere 20 watts of power, whereas Tian, or one delicious looking sandwich, as you can see, whereas Tianhe 2 requires 24 megawatts of power to do roughly the same amount of work. That's 1.2 million times the amount of energy. All of the power in Greater London, by the way, could only, could only power around 150 of these supercomputers. So that's a lot of energy. Even under, the, even under the best assumptions, the human brain will still be a million times more power efficient than the best computers. Today, it's thought that 10% of the world's energy supply is used in some form of IT, be that to power the smartphones or the computers that you're using, or at the data center level. And that's because not all of the processing is occurring at the data center level, but, uh, at the supercomputer level, sorry, but is occurring in machines that are far less efficient um, that, than, than the world's fastest supercomputer. So even as these machines get more and more efficient, they simply can't keep up with the huge growth in data. The number of devices is getting ever larger, and to compound the issue, the amount of data being created by each of those devices is getting larger and larger. Now, <clears throat> just as in the human body, not all of the processing will occur in the data center or, or the brain. Take your fitness tracker, for example. That connects to your phone, provides it with raw data, and it's that raw data that gets processed at the phone level and passed up to the data center eventually. And that's where most of the power will be used on an absolute basis, in charging and using all of these devices every day. So all of the smart devices and, uh, and sensors that you're talking about. But in terms of raw computing intensity and power intensity, it's at the data center level that all of this power really kicks in. Much like the human body, where, only t where the brain only accounts for 2% of the mass, the data center only accounts for a small proportion of the network as a whole, but takes up a huge amount, uh, takes up a disproportionate amount of energy. Already, the data center industry emits more carbon dioxide than the airline industry. So even though, uh, even though we're set up with as many IP addresses as we could ever possibly need, and all of you smart people are creating some amazing devices, the energy aspect of all of this has been largely ignored. Spare capacity in the UK grid has fallen from 15% to 4% today. And the risk of UK blackouts has consequently tripled from 1 in 12 to 1 in 4. In Europe, the situation is much the same, if not worse. 70% of continental Europe now relies on the same grid. Energy imports are rising. It's thought that by 2030, energy imports into Europe will account for 55% of the energy. And those imports are coming from, how can I put it nicely, some less stable countries than, uh, than Western Europe. And it's not just the Internet of Things that needs to be powered by the data center. Some of us were at a, an HPC conference earlier this year, a high-performance computing conference, and there the need for power is much the same. So as we join the dots, it turns out that all of these huge advances in technology, as I've put here, are more or less reliant upon the same resource, and that's power. And that means the same old infrastructure and the same tired power grids. So when we think about, so when we think about where to place the brains of our network, Let's invoke a little bit of natural selection. The first step as we look at the world map is relatively easy. Most of the world is simply too warm. That's not to say it's impossible to place data centers here, and in fact, many, many data centers are placed in this area. It simply isn't optimal given today's computers. Likewise, there are parts of the world which are simply too cold. Humidity starts to become an issue as temperatures drop too low. So that leaves us with these two bands of ideal location. Now, <clears throat> when we think about the data markets of the world today, they're primarily the Americas and Europe. So placing data centers somewhere in between would be ideal. Clearly, we can't place them in the middle of the ocean, so that brings us 
to thinking about this part of the world here. The next step is thinking about power. We need access to stable, cost-effective power generated without too much damage to the environment. And that's where we looked at, well, that's where we look at Iceland's isolated grid. The fact that it has an isolated grid means that it's insulated from neighboring countries. And in fact, has one of the most stable power grids in the world, which is generated entirely from renewable sources. So that seems to work. But we haven't quite finished, because we then need to think about um, fiber connectivity to the rest of the world. If we want to place our, place our data center in the ideal place, it needs to have strong fiber connectivity to primarily the Americas and Europe, and therefore the rest of the world. And in this regard, it turns out that Iceland is incredibly well placed. So having mirrored the natural selection processes of the human body, which have placed the brain in the ideal location, i.e. strong physical uh, security, ample energy supply, and strong connectivity to the rest of the body, I think we've just identified one of the ideal places in the world to place the brains of our network. In order to power the Internet of Things, what we ought to do is build a physically secure data center, uh, data center campus in Iceland taking advantage of its physical, physical location, incredible and, and, uh, incredibly ample and, um, and stable energy supply, as well as strong fiber connectivity to the rest of the world. So what I would like to do is invite you to seriously think about your power needs before those power needs become the constraints to your creativity and your ambitions. And I don't think it takes a supercomputer or a brain surgeon to guess where we at Vern Global might have placed our data center. Thank you. Thank you very much. A 44-acre data centre uh, based in <laughs> Keflavik in Iceland, a strategic location between the world's two largest data centre markets. Yes, I was wondering what Vern Global did, and then I, I, know, I, yeah. I worked it out. <laughs> the, the Sherlock Holmes in me worked it out there right at the end. I didn't want to give it away to start with. So No, of course. <laughs> no, no. Well, the, your, your, your deceit was, was a sound one, absolutely. <laughs> um, and the whole natural selection thing, I mean, again, we've, we've touched on this um, several times, one of the presentations earlier about uh, actors being smaller actors, you know, you're able to break down the network into its constituent parts. Mm -hmm. And I think the approach you took, obviously, to isolating that Iceland's a good place, it was interesting. Like, I, can, I can see the thought that's gone into that. But then also taking that away from what you guys do, then applying that in some other practices that, that we're looking at here as well. Um, does anyone um, have any questions for Furhan at this point? Yes, we have a question at the back there, and very handy microphone. Um, Hello. Isn't Iceland a giant volcano? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you would say. I mean, I mean, cl clearly, clearly, that there is volcanic activity in Iceland, and that's you know that's what gives us the geothermal power to be, to be able to power all and give you cheap power and uh, and stable power ultimately. I mean, <laughs> thinking about physical risks in the world, there are huge physical risks in, in most parts of the world. Take the, uh, take the west coast of the US, there's, mm. there's earthquake risk there. And, um, you know, yes, there are, there are volcanoes in Iceland. And actually, we've been operational since, uh, since 2012, and we've managed to cope with all of them. So, um, you know, if you build it in the right way, and you're aware of the risks, and you take all of that into account when you're building, you can mitigate them um, for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm.